medcram.com. Welcome to another medcram video. This is what's been keeping me from making videos over the last month. Influenza A. This is a patient of mine that was actually just discharged from the hospital where she was admitted for a couple of days because she got Influenza A and specifically the H1N1 from 2009. Pretty rough situation for her. So what is it that's going on right now in the United States in terms of Influenza A? This is from CBS News, and they are reporting that emergency room visits with influenza are now very high nationwide, especially in the West. And some of you who are watching this can probably leave comments below about how many of you have come down with the flu and how many of you have had to go into the hospital. They say that this season's wave of flu cases is arriving later. So it's peaking a little bit later than it normally does in the past two years. And it looks to be closely in line with the last flu season that we had before the COVID-19 pandemic. In Oregon, the CDC's data shows that 8.4% of all emergency room visits involved flu at the end of December. And this is now more than three times higher than the peak reached last season. So definitely worse. They say here 1,100 versus 251 and the same months back in 2023. So what about the flu vaccine? It used to be that they put four strains in the flu vaccine. It was based on what they were seeing in the Southern Hemisphere in the summertime, in the Northern Hemisphere, what's going on in the wintertime in the Southern Hemisphere so they can prepare for it. Because there was a type of influenza, influenza B, that they haven't seen in about four or five years, they got rid of that, and now it's just a triple. So not quadrivalent, but trivalent. What they're putting in there is a influenza A Victoria, which is H1N1 pandemic 2009-like, but not exactly that. They've put that in there. They've put another influenza A in there. That's an H3N2 that we see circulating around. And then a B, Austria, which is a Victoria lineage-like as well. For those who are not getting the egg base vaccine, but a cell culture, a very similar H1N1 pandemic 2009, a Massachusetts H3N2-like, and again, the Austrian uh, Victoria lineage as well. So these are the ones that they are putting in the current vaccine profiles in terms of vaccination. How is it doing? Well, we don't have data yet in the Northern Hemisphere, but we already know how things went in the Southern Hemisphere in terms of those vaccines. They said that the effectiveness of the seasonal flu vaccine against hospitalization among high-risk groups during the 2024 season in the Southern Hemisphere was actually pretty low. It was 35%. So there was a 35% reduction in hospitalization. And that's actually down in 2023 from 50%, but not outside the expected range, which actually may portend similar efficacy during the upcoming Northern Hemisphere flu. And that's what we're seeing right now. It may be the reason why we're starting to see more and more of those hospitalizations. At least I am seeing more and more of those hospitalizations. So slightly reduced in terms of efficacy of the flu vaccine. It also may be because there's less people taking the flu vaccine to begin with. If we look at 2019, that's this one right here. You will see that compared to 2019 to 2020, where we are right now in 2024 to 2025 is this lowest one right here, and zero being right here. So there is a significant drop-off from before the pandemic to now in terms of how many people are getting vaccinated with influenza vaccine. As you can see, the highest amount of uptake was during the 2020 to 2021 year. That was the year that basically we had the first year of the COVID pandemic and the mRNA vaccines had not yet come out. So here we're reviewing the slices of the Swiss cheese that we like to talk about. If we're trying to prevent viral particles here that are shooting through, the analogy that we like to use are slices of Swiss cheese, where each slice can reduce the incidence of hospitalization or death or disease by a certain percentage. And because those Swiss cheese holes are in different places, the more slices of Swiss cheese that you have, the better your chances of having 0% chance of getting influenza. And of course, no one slice is going to be 100% effective. So the more things you can institute, the better off you're going to be in the end. So we talk about some of these things that many people talk about, vaccines, 
You can also talk about antiviral drugs, which of course don't prevent the flu, but can help treat when you get the flu. Unfortunately, the endpoints on a lot of these antiviral medications is literally just 24 hours less of symptoms. So it's not a huge deal, but just be aware that they are there and I just list them there for you in case you're interested. So how do we do last year with influenza? This is influenza positive test reported to the CDC by clinical laboratories. It's hard to see here, but this is 2023, 2023, 2023, and that ends right about there. That's the new year. And as you can see, either just before or just after New Year's when we start to see the peak in influenza diagnosis. So where are we now currently? You can see that towards the end of the year, this is the week ending December 21st, we are still on the upswing. It may be, it's hard to tell whether or not we're peaking or not, but based on what we saw there in Oregon and at the beginning of this video, things have really taken off and we may have gotten into this a little bit late. So what about, instead of the flu, let's talk about COVID-19. They say here that the modeling published over Christmas estimated that this winter's COVID-19 wave is also not expected to be as large as some previous winter surges, in part given the lack so far of the new immune escape variant. So we don't have an escape variant this winter. So hopefully the COVID-19 surge that we might have seen here in the wintertime is going to be less. The CDC last estimated that most COVID infections are from the XEC variant, which officials have said is closely related to previous strains. So previous immunity to that strain may actually be beneficial in keeping the amount of COVID-19 viral infections down. They say that the LP.8.1 strain that variant trackers have been closely monitoring, still only making up one out of 10 cases. So that's very reassuring in terms of COVID-19. However, the CDC's wastewater surveillance suggests that COVID-19 levels have only recently gone from moderate to high levels nationwide. And so we need to watch that, especially in the Midwest, where they are actually seeing a large share of emergency room visits with COVID-19, although they're a fraction of what was last winter's peak. So you can see here that as we are going into the new year in 2025, we're starting to see, especially in the Midwest, a recrudescence here of of the incidence of viral particles in the wastewater. Now this area here is a little bit in question and that is being looked at as data comes in. So hopefully we'll get a little bit of an understanding. It is starting to go up, that is not unexpected. Briefly, let's talk about the bird flu. So as opposed to what we're seeing here with human influenza, which is H3 or H1 in these sort of cases currently, although you can have other H numbers, what we're talking about here is H5 bird flu. Really important to understand is that there is no person-to-person -person spread at all. And what we're seeing here is 100% so far of the cases in this country of bird flu, which is an influenza, which is an H5 influenza, they're all coming directly from the reservoir, either the birds or some other animal that's giving the person the H5 bird flu. This normally has about a 50% mortality rate. Kind of unusual that there's been a number of cases since the beginning of 2024, and specifically about 66 human cases in the country. And what we found is that this is the first time someone has actually died of H5N1, and this patient was in specifically in Louisiana. And the CDC just announced that today, as I was making this video, it's the first one. Fortunately, we have not seen too much of a crossover. Again, about 66 human cases in 2024. In 2022, there were 67 cases, so it's pretty similar, but it's devastated the wildlife, cattle, birds, things of that nature. In terms of cattle, it's infected the milk and it's caused them to become more listless and decreased energy. In terms of cats that have come down with the virus, it's fatal in many of those animals and also, of course, in birds. This is the first time that it's been fatal this year, at least in humans. We're not seeing any indications of human-to-human -human spread. That's really important to make sure. Why is all this happening? Why is this occurring? And as you can see, going back many, many decades, as far back as 2013, we can predict with pretty good accuracy when we are going to have influenza spikes in the population. Now here we're measuring actually deaths. 
this is hard to fudge the numbers on. These are deaths that are due to influenza. It's pretty easy to see if someone has influenza because we have nucleic acid testing that we can do, as we showed you at the beginning. And of course, if somebody comes in and they're positive for influenza and they develop influenza virus-like diseases like pneumonia or cardiac inflammation that we can sometimes see, this is where we're going to see it. It's usually a few weeks after the shortest day of the year, which of course in the Northern Hemisphere, which is what this is looking at here in the United States, that's gonna be December 21st, which is the shortest day of the year. It's when there's the least amount of sunlight. So we have a reduction in sunlight. But what else do we have? We also have a reduction in temperature, and you might say a change in humidity. So people have often wondered, what is it that comes on every year that does it? Well, certainly there is a lack of sunlight. That's pretty uniform. That has to simply do with the curvature of the Earth and the fact that our orbit as it goes around is tilted so that in the summertime, the northern hemisphere is generally facing the sun. And in our wintertime in the northern hemisphere, it's tilted away from the sun as it spins. There's also, because of that, lower temperature. So are we going inside? Are we spreading the virus around? Does the cold air or the humidity affect that? I mean, these are all great arguments, right? So just to be clear about this, I want to show you Australia, which of course is in the southern hemisphere. And true to form, what we see here is we see these peaks happening not in December, but in July. But what's consistent here is that, again, this is a few weeks after the shortest day of the year. This is a few weeks after winter begins. And of course, winter in Australia is in July. Is it the temperature that's going on? Well, let's take a look and see if that rings true. This is we're looking at Sydney, Australia, which is a pretty big populous center in Australia. And we'll look at winter. And July is one of those months right smack dab in the middle of winter. And look at these temperatures in Fahrenheit. We're going from a low of 45 to a high of 63. This is not exactly winter cold that we would find in Canada or in the Northeast of the United States. This is pretty mild. So I think that argument about going inside and it being very cold is not a very satisfactory explanation. In fact, what we see here, going back to the United States, is we see just about every single natural cause of death, whether it's Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, influenza, pneumonia, kidney disease, respiratory disease, stroke, heart disease, all of these things peak after the shortest day of the year every single year. The only thing that doesn't peak are accidents, and we know that those are higher in the summertime when people are traveling. Look at this. I mean, just stop and think about this. All of these diseases seem to peak right after the shortest day of the year. Look here at influenza and pneumonia, which is this one right here. We're talking about this orange one right here. Notice there's times of the year in the summertime specifically, where we hardly see any influenza. Look at the delta on this. That's the delta. Sometimes it's, it's actually not that high. We actually call this the flu season. And the reason why we call it the flu season is because it comes and then it goes. But I want you to notice, in terms of heart disease, there's actually a larger delta in the wintertime that we see of cardiovascular disease. But we don't call it the heart disease season. And the reason is, is because even at the baseline, it's the number one killer. But there's actually a bigger variation in cardiac disease in the wintertime than there is what we see with influenza. That's pretty impressive. So again, is it sunlight? Is it temperature? Is it humidity? They actually looked at this for COVID-19, and they wanted to see when did the surges occur in the autumn of 2020. And so they looked at it geographically. They lined up these countries, and they looked over time to see when the inflation date was. And when they looked at the correlation for temperature, there was absolutely no correlation. The correlation was zero. When they looked at humidity, same thing, correlation, zero. But when they looked at the surge inflation date in Europe and they plotted against latitude, which of course is tightly connected with sunlight, there was a very good correlation of 0.77. In other words, the surge in COVID-19 started in Finland and went down the continent and ended up in Greece. I think the data is minimizing the effects based on humidity and temperature and maximizing the chances that this is related to sun exposure. 
I mean, this is not far-fetched. We've looked at randomized control trials where they took patients with COVID-19 in this case. And they illuminated them with 940 nanometer infrared light. The majority of the photons coming from the sun are in the infrared spectrum. And they made a jacket where they basically put it on everybody, but randomized whether it was turned on or not on COVID patients that were admitted to the hospital. And they only did it for about 15 minutes a day for seven days. And this was published in a pretty high impact factor journal. We talked about this before. Look at all of these p-values that are statistically significant, whether you're talking about oxygen saturation, tidal volume, the inspiratory and expiratory pressures, the respiratory rate, heart rates, lymphocyte even, and even the days of hospitalization were better in those that got infrared light compared to those that just got the standard of care. So it's certainly possible that sunlight is having a role here. We're not saying that it has nothing to do with temperature or humidity, but we're saying here that in fact sunlight may play a big role in infectious disease and especially in influenza. And that's exactly what the Harvard Kennedy School found when they published a paper just four years ago in 2020 looking at this very same question. So what they did is they looked at CDC data for influenza and maps throughout the country, and they combined it with solar radiation data from the National Solar Radiation Database. So it's not just latitude, right? That's a correlate. But you can actually look geographically across the United States and see what particular areas get the most amount of sunlight. That's a a more robust way of doing it. And I can give you the hint here is that they found that sunlight strongly protects against getting influenza. Influenza typically comes in the wintertime when the sun is the lowest in the sky, the days are the shortest, the weather is the coolest. So how are you going to tease that out? Well, something happened in 2009 that helped us out a great deal, and that was called the H1N1 2009 pandemic. As you can see here, in terms of when that pandemic hit, it hit much earlier in the year than we typically see in the autumn and the winter. In fact, it actually started in the summer months. This is when it should have been warmer. This is when the humidity might have been a little bit different. And so this gave us much better data points than we would have gotten otherwise. And so actually, when you put the data points out, this is typically where all the data points reside until 2009. And then what happens in 2009 is because there was more cloud cover and less sunlight during that summertime of 2009, we were able to actually get a lot of variable information And we were able to plot out the mean sunlight levels with the flu index. And when we did so, we got this nice line that showed very clearly that as sunlight increases in this direction, what we see is influenza indexes dropping precipitously. They say here that in addition, there was substantially less sunlight that year than in the average year and much more variability in those deviations. These deviations facilitate estimation. And that's why they were able to tease out this effect from sunlight to the point that they were able to say, we find that sunlight strongly protects against getting influenza. So if you want to avoid getting this type of lab report at the hospital when you go in ill, Let me suggest the Swiss cheese model. And a lot of people are going to be talking about vaccination, and a lot of people are going to be talking about antivirals. If you do come down with the virus, let me tell you something that not many people are going to be telling. I'm going to add this to what they are already telling you, and that is in the wintertime, here in the Northern Hemisphere, the amount of sun that's coming in that you're going to be getting is extremely low. And it behooves you to go outside and to get it even more so in the wintertime. I don't think we've peaked yet. And so a good, reasonable approach is to get 20 to 30 minutes of extra sunlight every day, especially if you're someone who cannot take the vaccine. Thanks for joining us. 